1995, Casper the Friendly Ghost made his theatrical debut in Caspar, the tale of a lonely ghost who lives in a creepy mansion called Whipstaff with his mischievous uncles, the Ghostly Trio. All Casper wants is a friend, but he unintentionally terrorizes everyone he comes into contact with. When villainous Carrigan, played by Kathy Moriarty, gets left the mansion in her father's will and learns that there is treasure there, she and her snivelling lawyer sidekick Dibs, played by a really out of place Eric Idle, try to gain access into the mansion, but can't due to the antics of the ghostly trio, where ghost psychic Dr. Harvey, played by Bill Pullman, and his daughter Kat, played by Christina Ritchie, are hired to move into the house and try and rid it of its spirits, where Kat sparks up a powerful friendship with Caspar, a friendship that goes beyond life and death in this classic movie that feels like Casper painted with shades of E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Can I keep you? So sit back and get ready to go on a trip down memory lane as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about Casper, the 90s movie. So let's check it out. Number 10, Casper's Origins. Casper was introduced in a children's storybook called The Friendly Ghost, which was put together in 1939, making him as old as Batman. The book was written by Seymour Reed, who would go on to work for Mad Magazine, and Joe Oriolo, who would go on to create Felix the Cat. The rights to the book were sold to Paramount Pictures, who in 1945 released Casper's first theatrical animated short, simply called The Friendly Ghost, where Casper would go on to star in several animated shorts over the following years. Casper also became a popular comic book character. At first, the Casper comics were published by Famous Studios, which were owned by Paramount, but Casper would be brought by Harvey Comics, who published comics of other popular characters such as Richie Rich and Wendy the Good Little Witch, where over the years Casper would become the face of Harvey Comics as its most famous character. And since then, there have been several different comics, books, and cartoon versions based on the character. The premise of Casper is relatively simple. He's a friendly ghost who just wants a friend, but despite being kind and friendly, everyone is terrified of him. And by the looks of things, even Jaws is terrified of him. However, Jaws isn't the only ties that Casper would have to Steven Spielberg. Number nine, from Flintstones to Casper. Legendary filmmaker Steven Spielberg had his sights set on making a Casper movie with him acting as a producer. Casper was actually going to appear in the Spielberg produced movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit a few years earlier, in a scene which was to feature Marvin Acme's funeral, but the scene was cut. Before Casper, Spielberg had previously produced another well-known child-based franchise, the Flintstones movie, one year earlier in 1994, which despite bad reviews, was actually quite successful at the box office. Also that year, another Harvey Comics character got their own movie, that being Richie Rich, which not only got negative reviews, but also performed poorly at the box office. So Casper would have been something of a gamble to make sure this time it was done right. The movie was to be distributed by Universal Pictures, and Spielberg's Amberlin Company joined forces with the Harvey Entertainment Group who owned Casper, with both companies producing the movie. Number 8, the director's first feature film. Spielberg hired TV director Brad Silberling to direct Casper. Silberling had previously directed episodes of Doogie Howser MD, LA Law, and NYPD Blue. However, he never directed a feature film prior to Casper, but Spielberg chose him after watching an episode of a sitcom called Brooklyn Bridge, of which Silberling had directed. And when watching Casper, you can see that Silberling has a great cinematic eye, and the movie looks theatrical, and you would never think the director had only previously directed for TV. After Casper, Silberling would go on to direct more serious movies, such as Cities of Angels and Moonlight Mile. The last film he directed was 2017's Ordinary Man. The Casper script was written by Sherry Stoner and Deanna Oliver, both of whom had previously worked with Spielberg, writing episodes of Tiny Toons and Animaniacs. However, a young J.J. Abrams also did some uncredited work on the script. And when it came to the Casper movie, the scriptwriters took the character into interesting directions. 
Number 7. The Dark Recesses of Caspar Casper is what I like to call a mature kids movie, in that yes, aesthetically it looks like a children's film, and it is one, but within the movie's DNA there are many intricate layers of mature and adult themes, in this case dealing with death and mourning. The 1995 Casper movie is the first piece of Casper media that had gone to such dark places, like facing the reality of death, grieving and the passing of loved ones. I really like this, as yes, it's entertaining children, but also treating them with respect and intelligence, while explaining that unfortunately, death is a real sad thing that does happen. Even Casper is given a backstory, where it's explained that he was previously alive and died as a child of pneumonia. I always found that revelation in the movie to be heartbreaking. Before the movie, Casper was simply just a happy tale, with Casper as a happy-go-lucky ghost. In fact, in some of the comics, it's explained that Casper was even born a ghost to ghost parents. But the Casper movie has many dark layers. Heck, some of the scenes look like it resembles a Tim Burton movie. However, there are some elements of the movie that do clash with the more intelligent ones. Number 6. The Casper movie is a hive of pop cultural references. So I've mentioned the Casper movie deals with some very mature themes of which it treats respectfully, which I think has made the movie age quite well. However, something that may have aged not as well is all the 90s pop cultural references that are scattered throughout the movie, and they are very 90s. Like, as in we see Casper watching tabloid news show Hard Copy, we get cameos from the likes of Mel Gibson and the Crypt Keeper from Tales from the Crypt, in one scene, Casper manages to give himself a muscular physique and talks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. The ghostly trio even do a Three Musketeers joke because I guess the Three Musketeers had recently come out at the time. Oh, one and one for all. Your pants before they fall. Yeah, this movie is definitely a product of the 90s, but it also has references to pop culture in general. Like Kat mentioned Stephen King when arriving at the mansion, director Brad Silberling said in the DVD commentary that when the construction workers are fleeing, one yells out, Run Charlie Run, which was a reference to the Swim Charlie Swim line from Jaws. And the most notable reference is seeing Dan Aykroyd returning as Ray Stance in his complete Ghostbusters getup. Who are you gonna call? Someone else. Wow, back in the day, this was a huge deal and got everyone talking. I can even remember reading about it in newspapers, that's how much of a big deal it was. And it got me and all my friends talking about it as we so desperately wanted to see a Ghostbusters 3. And sadly, that brief cameo is the closest we would get to a Ghostbusters 3. Well, at least for the time being, anyway. Some people may find all the pop cultural references a bit out of date or tiresome, but... I don't know. I think they have a certain charm about them. Number 5. First movie to use a CGI character in the lead role The special effects for Casper were achieved by the special effects wizards of Industrial Light and Magic, who provided the special effects for most Spielberg-related movies. The ghosts were created by early CGI. To me, this is CGI done right, when there is no other way of creating Casper onto the big screen. Although it's normal for CGI characters to be leads in movies nowadays, what with the likes of the Lion King remake, the Sonic movie, and the Call of the Wild, back in 1995 this was a big deal, as Casper was the first movie to achieve this. While filming Casper, when Bill Pullman and Christina Ricci were interacting with Casper and the ghostly trio, they were actually interacting with tennis balls that stood in for them. Incidentally, Casper was played by two people. Malachi Pearson, who was a child voice actor who voiced Casper, and Devon Sauer, who played Casper in his alive form. And it's worth mentioning that the ghostly trio brother, Fatso, was voiced by Everyone Loves Raymond star, Brad Garrett. Of which, when Casper came out, his voice work got a lot of praise from critics. Number 4. Backstreet's Back at Whipstaff Manor The Casper movie is set in a fictional town called Friendship in Maine. I guess Maine was used as a Stephen King reference, but I'm not too sure. Most of the exterior filming for Casper was filmed in Camden, which is a town in Maine's mid-coast region. The inside of Whipstaff Manor was filmed on interior sets in studio, to which they look pretty spectacular. 
and not to let the whip staff set go to waste, the set was reused for the Backstreet's Boy music video for Everybody Backstreet's Back. And yes, when you see shots of the group dancing, you can see the spiral pattern on the floor. Although it looks like they cleaned it up for the Backstreet's Back music video. But it's just cool knowing that the set would go on to be reused for one of the most iconic songs of the 90s. Speaking of music, the music for Casper was composed by James Horner. And as usual, it's brilliant. It has moments of fun playfulness, but also has moments of sad tragedy, where the music taps into the darker themes of the movie. That very same year, Horner also composed the music for Braveheart, so this is at a time when he was at top of his game. However, one thing I will say about the music in Caspar is that it does sound like James Horner was heavily influenced by Danny Elfman, as some of the music does sound similar to musical cues from Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands. I mean, just listen. And interestingly enough, a pop song version of the Casper theme was released, which was sung by Little Richard. And even more random, many of the early trailers for Casper featured the Beetlejuice theme playing in the background. However, I've noticed in the 90s, the Beetlejuice theme was used in a lot of trailers, particularly wacky comedies that have supernatural elements. Number 3. Animated Series After Casper was released, there were plans to get straight to work on a sequel. However, Bill Pullman and Christina Ritchie were unavailable. So instead, it was decided to continue the movie with an animated series called The Spectacular New Adventures of Casper, which is set in Whipstaff Manor and continues the adventures of Casper and Cat. And firstly, the animation looks great. It's both fun and playful, but also true to the movie. And I love the transparent effect used for Casper and the other ghosts. I watched an episode in preparation for this video, and the only real gripe I have with it is that I felt they got the character Cat wrong. They made her kind of smug and not as likeable as she was in the movie, but that's just my opinion. The series actually lasted for four seasons, spanning from 1996 to 1998. There was also a Casper video game on Super Nintendo, where you play as Casper, where you have to protect Cat from dangers, obstacles, and villains as you both stroll around Whipstaff Manor collecting items. Yeah, if I remember correctly, this game wasn't exactly a big deal when it came out, and I don't think any of my friends were talking about it anyway. Number 2. Sequels Lost in Translation As mentioned, Amberlynn and Universal had intended on making a sequel to Caspar. In fact, a script was written. However, Pullman and Ritchie were unavailable, as mentioned, and to make matters worse, Universal and Amberlynn lost confidence in the sequel after Caspar made less money than anticipated in the box office, which led to Harvey Entertainment teaming up with 20th Century Fox and home of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Saban Entertainment to create the weird anomaly that is Casper A Spirited Beginning, a straight-to-video sequel slash prequel, where the mature, meaningful themes of the first movie have been replaced with childish slapstick grade school humor. When I saw it for the first time, I remember thinking it felt way more babyish than the first one. Although A Spirited Beginning advertised itself as a prequel to the theatrical movie, there are tons of things that contradict the first movie, such as there is no Whipstaff Manor, and in the movie it's explained that Casper died 100 years ago, whereas in A Spirited Beginning, he's died in modern day. You can also see a complete downgrade in special effects, of which really make you appreciate industrial light and magic. There was another sequel called Casper Meets Wendy, as in Wendy the Witch, another Harvey character, who was played by a very young Hilary Duff. However, that movie suffered the same problems as A Spirited Beginning. Look, I don't want to trash these movies too much, as they are just harmless movies made for small children. But that's kind of the problem. Whereas the theatrical movie had themes for all ages to relate to, the straight-to-video sequels de-evolved Casper to the movie equivalent of a jack-in-the-box. Number 1. A Spooky Reception Casper was released in May 1995 and opened up at the number one spot in the box office and made $287 million on a $55 million budget, making it a financial success. Although the studios clearly anticipated the movie making more money, hence the resistance to make a sequel. Well, at least a true sequel. The film got fairly average reviews from critics. The special effects were praised and considered the main selling point of the movie, along with Bill Pullman's and Christina Ricci's performances. So the reviews were okay, but nothing overly spectacular. 
The Rotten Tomato consensus claims Casper to be, quote, a mindless family movie. Um, did they not see the movie and notice the themes of death, loss, and acceptance? Hardly mindless. In 1995, Casper was nominated for Worst Picture at the Stinkers Award, but lost to Showgirls. Of which I have to say, really? Like, really? Okay, Casper may not be a perfect movie, but come on, it wasn't that bad. Over the years, Casper is now considered a beloved classic, enjoyed by those who grew up watching it. It seemed that those who the movie was talking to when they were kids have a love for it, and it's become a childhood Halloween favorite, with the likes of Hocus Pocus. Casper is a good movie. I think its biggest crime is that the powers that be expected too much of it, and it didn't live up to those expectations. Yes, it's silly in parts, and its dialogue is very 1990s inspired, particularly the more jokey lines. But the movie has a good heart and poses many interesting questions to both children and adults about life and the afterlife. So that was my look into Casper. I hope you enjoyed it. It's definitely a movie that 90s kids should rewatch and go on a trip down memory lane with. And no doubt new, younger viewers would get enjoyment out of it too. Anyway, I'm Minty, and all for one and one for all, catch your pants before they fall. See ya!